The nervous system only changes if something is new and different. So anyway, we could talk a lot about habit formation, but fear works, but so does disrupting the story. How do you disrupt the story? You essentially give the opposite story and you think, well, that's just lying to myself. But neurally, it makes sense because the nervous system, again, likes to be very economical, likes to do everything with the minimum amount of uh, energetic expenditure. And to change anything requires attention and attention is expensive. I also wonder about habit formation. So you said there that some of the more sort of startling stimuluses like fear are great ways and, and obsessive sort of deep focus are great ways to start forming these new behavior patterns. But if I want to break a habit, because there's habits I've got in my life that I've kind of just told myself are who I am. And accordingly, I've just kind of accepted them. Well, you've been very successful, so. Yeah, but even with all, there's all things, thank you, but with, there's many things I'd still... I've just accepted it's part of who I am. Some of those come from my childhood. So one of them is that I grew up in a very disorganized home where like the doors inside my house had holes in them and our house, there was like some rooms that looked like a hoarder lived there, just piles and piles of stuff to the roof. Um, house dem demolished in many respects. Like the back of the garden was six foot high. It was, it was a mess. So I've grown up with mess and I'm therefore still pretty messy today. And it's something I've always wanted to defeat, but I just, sometimes I tell myself, well, it, you know, it was hardwired into me when I was a kid and it, it is just who I am. And a lot of people go around saying that. They've just mm -hmm. kind of identified with and accepted a certain bad habit is part of who they are. Well, I will say that some of the most brilliant people I know had terribly messy offices yeah. and they were very internally organized people. It was kind of interesting. They were like a laser beam in their ability to, kind of sort through mess. They didn't see the mess. In fact, my postdoc advisor, who also sadly passed away, an incredible human by the name of Ben Barris, used to walk into his office and there'd just be piles of stuff everywhere. And I'd say, Ben, I, I think we should clean your office. And he'd say, don't touch anything because if you move anything, I won't know where it is. And I said, how could you possibly know where anything is right now? And he said, I know where everything is. And so I think some people also, by growing up in or being in that environment, also maintain an uncanny ability to find things. Whereas I'm the sort of person where I can't do any work until everything is cleared away. And so um, I see myself as on the weaker side of this ability. Um, but to your question, I think stories are very powerful and very dangerous. Stories are the way that humans organize knowledge by and large, right? We don't tend to organize things into lists, we have these narratives that we call stories because from a young age, we learn things not just by hearing them and seeing them, but they are compartmentalized into narratives that have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Sometimes they have a uh, kind of a crescendo and then a relaxation. Just think about a childhood song of learning like the ABCs. They don't teach you the ABCs, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, right? They don't do that. What do they do? They give you a song, which is a story. Musicians will understand this inherently. Again, I'm not one, but when I started researching neuroscience of music and the brain, I came to understand, so it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? The change in the inflections, as one does the alphabet as a young kid, is the story of the alphabet. Now, people might say, okay, wh what is he talking about? What's happening here is you create variation in terms of batching of ideas so that something has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So if you think, okay, I grew up in this house and it was really messy and now I have too much mess. And in order to undo that, there's this kind of like hardwired, right? Dangerous words, hardwired neural circuitry in my brain that I would have to work really, really hard to undo and I'd have to be scared into being a cleaner person or, you know, or a more tidier person, whatever it is. That's very dangerous because there's a beginning to that, a middle to that and an end to that. And it has immense meaning as a consequence. One of the most powerful things is to understand that neuroplasticity really involves taking an existing story and dismantling some component of it. What could the component be? Well, there's all this stuff like the Byron Katie work, which says, you know, you, you take something that you believe as true and you say, okay, like, uh, like I'm an untidy person. And then you counter it. How do I know that? Well, okay, I have this experience. Okay. That's the story. And then you start running counter narratives. You say, I'm, uh, I'm, 
uh, actually a tidy person. And then people say, well, this is silly. You're just lying to yourself, right? Where they say, is it always true that you're a messy person? You start challenging this story from different sides. Now, I believe, as because I'm a neuroscientist, I'm not um, in, I'm not a psychologist or in the self-help world, that the brilliance, the kind of unconscious genius of that approach is actually that what one is doing is you're starting to create a new story. You're starting to kind of infuse different questions into the existing neural network. Now, the brain loves questions. Like the, the brain, since we're, we're young kids, we're asking questions. And so if you take an existing story and you start challenging it with questions, you're not saying lie to yourself. You're not suddenly gonna say, okay, like I'm super tidy. You're not gonna, cause you're not gonna believe that. But if you start challenging why it's that way, or you know, you've been able to change so many other things, why you, wouldn't you be able to change that? Well, you say, well, it's just a habit. I can't do it. You say, well, what's a habit? And you start poking and pushing and pushing. What you eventually arrive at is this kind of, huh, actually there's nothing keeping me from being a tidy person except this kind of fluency of a particular story. What you've done is you've interrupted the fluency of that story. So then when you go to the behavior of, you know, do you set things down all over the place or do you put them in an orderly fashion? You start interrupting the habit, the fluency of your typical behavior. So I raise this as a, as a way um, to kind of shine light on essentially what I do in my podcast career, which is, you know, we, I, I believe very strongly in the fields of psychology. I think self-help has some wonderful things to offer. We've got ancient wisdom that goes way back. And when you start to look at things through the lens of biology, you start to see that all of these things actually have merit and they're just different paths to the same outcomes. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to become a tidy person, I would encourage you, here would be one, let's just say neuroscience supported approach would be to write out one page about what, a tidy person you really are, you'll know that's a lie, right? And then to look at it and realize that in many ways, if you just replace tidy with, you know, messy at any location, it'd probably be the exact same story. Mm -hmm. And so what you're really talking about here is just a default that your nervous system is running. And if you were to just swap the words, would you feel differently or do differently? On the one hand, you'd say, no, that's kind of trivial, but I bet you the practice of writing it out would forever interrupt your notion of like just going to set something down. He'd be like, oh, now you have something to kind of disrupt the habit. Because so much of habit disruption that you'll look like, some people say, oh, you flick a uh, you know, rubber band on your wrist or something like that. Mm -hmm. There's nothing special about the rubber band. There's nothing special about the pain on your wrist or that you put a sticky note. We know sticky notes work for about one day. Why don't sticky notes work? Why don't reminders on the mirror work? Because they don't have enough salience. They're not new. They're not different. The nervous system only changes if something is new and different. So anyway, we could talk a lot about habit formation, but fear works, but so does disrupting the story. How do you disrupt the story? You essentially give the opposite story and you think, well, that's just lying to myself. But neurally, it makes sense because the nervous system, again, likes to be very economical, likes to do everything with the minimum amount of uh, energetic expenditure. And to change anything requires attention and attention is expensive. Attention is expensive. And also I would say, as I'm kind of rambling all this, things are going very well for you. So you actually don't have any reason to tidy your I space. I have a PA now and another PA and I have a cleaner. So it's, do you know what I mean? The Yeah, you outsource it. Yeah. Great. Well, there is incentive for all the folks that feel like they're not um, tidy enough. You have two choices. You can either start to be tidy now or you can be successful enough that you can hire some assistants. And I actually think, I say this in, in all seriousness, I think that one has to ask like, where is my attention and neural real estate best devoted? I think about this every day. I mean, we are living in a war of attention. I wake up in the morning and I can be a consumer or a creator. If I reach for my phone, I'm a consumer. Mm. If I go to my journal, I'm a creator. My advice to anyone who wants to be successful in any domain is to do things away from where you broadcast and then take it to that broadcast. I mean, take your real life to Instagram and be very cautious about taking Instagram to your real life. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, if you look yeah, yeah. at successful people, they're doing things away from the platforms and putting them on the platforms. Yeah. So I have to be very careful. Then I go into the kitchen. Obviously, I talk to people in my home. Um, but if I pick up the phone and I start making a phone call, it's like, is this call really about moving 
the needle forward or is this just kind of like passive use of, of attention? We have to be so careful nowadays, so, so careful. It's really challenging.